If you're a fan of Justice League Unlimited, a lot of that fandom likely has to do with the show's second season, known to many as the Cadmus Arc or Cadmus Conspiracy, a masterclass in serialized storytelling that built off of everything that had come before, not just previous episodes of JLU and Justice League, but everything from prior shady Black Ops groups in Superman the Animated Series to the most obscure Batman episodes to even an appearance by the robot. We'll get you your cameo, Z. I know it. One of the greatest sets of episodes in television history, and it all ended with Brainiac bursting out of Lex Luthor's body like a cockroach on steroids. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun of this, I still love the ending of this season. It's the perfect way for the Justice League to show Cadmus just how vital and necessary they are. I'll be dead. I mean, who else is gonna save the day when two of DC's biggest supervillains literally combine into one ultra mega metal Brainiac Mon? <laughs> But after Flash zips around the world and repeatedly punches the guy at a few million miles an hour, all the Brainiac bits separate themselves and we're left with a Lex Luthor very much deserving of being a contestant on the Discovery Channel. He's hauled away to jail, but breaks out by the start of the next season, where he's recruited to Gorilla Grodd's new Secret Society, or Legion of Doom, or whatever, and seems to be having side conversations with someone. I know, I'm going as fast as I can. An invisible, otherwise non-existent entity who turns out to be, dun dun dun, Brainiac. <laughs> But after a dozen more episodes and a thousand more important things happening, this plot point is basically never followed up on, never concluded, never nothing. Lex is just randomly seeing a vision of Brainiac. Or is he? And this precisely is our inciting incident here, our thesis statement for this video essay. Was Lex actually seeing Brainiac, or was this perhaps something much darker? Brainiac, I'm coming. Brainiac is known for his whole shtick of cataloging the knowledge of an entire planet and then blowing it up. But a much more benevolent way of going about it is like what Bruce Wayne did before he was Batman. Go to a new place, learn everything there is to know, and then leave it alone. And here's the thing I've always been most envious of. Batman's ability to just suddenly drop into a different spoken language. Domo arigato sensei. Quiz custodia dipsos custodias. But even this guy doesn't know every language. Language, these aliens are like, I can't go. And he's just up there doing a big eyebrow raise. He doesn't know what that means, but he might just be able to figure it out with today's sponsor, Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world with intuitive lessons to help you learn a language through real life conversations. You're not necessarily just sitting there studying the verb conjugation of a past tense Adject participant da blah 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 blah. You're learning real, useful, everyday phrases in a way that truly sinks into your brain and grows your fluency so much faster. Your mind and the language will be like. We are one. And we comprehend. What language would you want to pick up given the chance? I've always had mild success with Spanish, so I figured I'd try and improve past the level I was at while making class projects in high school. Hey, this drill of la casi totalidad de nuestros barcos. That's probably not right. Hablamos español, inglés y alemán. Hablamos español, inglés y alemán. En serio? Ustedes hablan muchos idiomas. Right now, you can get 60% off a Babbel subscription during their Black Friday sale. If you've ever wanted to learn, you can start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. Just use our link in the description. See? It worked for Batman. <laughs> Disclaimer, you cannot learn Kaznian on this app because it's not a real language, and neither is Imperiumese. Da, da, Thank you so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Less talking, more hitting! Much in the vein of the surrounding Cadmus arc shenanigans, even this Luthor Brainiac fusion dance concept called all the way back to eight years prior, the Superman episode Ghost in the Machine, where Brainiac has infiltrated the LexCorp computer system and traps Luthor in the basement to make him build him a new robotic body. Once he's back to his purple shoulder padded self, he shoots Luthor in the back with a beam of yellow or blue energy, depending on which version of the scene you're watching, don't worry about it. It actually essentially installs a copy of his programming into Luthor's, uh, operating system, shall we say. I always have a backup plan. By JLU season three, after the two's corporate merger has been dissolved, Luthor is still seeing what amount to force ghosts of Brainiac. Brainiac is there, guiding him, seemingly at all times, toward reuniting their consciousnesses yet again to become 
Luthoriac, or Brain Thor, or Robo Lexi Poo, whatever you want to call him. To get back to being Robo Lexi Poo, he's going to have to find some way to revive Brainiac yet again, and we catch glimpses throughout the season of him attempting to do just that, while the Brainiac Vision watches over his shoulder. To pull from another sci-fi series I watched a crap ton of around the same time, it's pretty much Gaius Baltar and number six in Battlestar Galactica if you've seen that. If you haven't, you're wrong. Come to think of it, I wonder if we were subconsciously remembering Firestorm when we came up with the Lex Brainiac's ghost gimmick in the Legion of Doom arc. But no, actually, I think we were just stealing from Six Feet Under. Which was a drama series from the early 2000s where the main characters, funeral homeowners, would often see and communicate with the dead. But while Baltar's head six, as she's referred to in production documents, turns out to be something I'm not gonna spoil in a video completely unrelated to Battlestar Galactica, in Justice League Unlimited, narratively, we're led to believe that Brainiac is somehow still inside Lex, for lack of better phrasing. Brainiac, I'm coming. Like a small part of his programming still remains somewhere buried in Lex's mind. Every time we as the audience witness Lex's interactions with Brainiac in this final season, every other character in the scene just thinks he's delusional. He's talking to his imaginary friend again. But Lex is pretty damn convinced. It's all he puts any time and energy toward, figuring out how to bring Brainiac out of his dreams and back into his car. So they may partake in the spooning world record once again. So for Lex, just how is this happening? Or is it happening at all? How can Brainiacs be real if our eyes aren't real? We're gonna do our darndest to figure this out, because while you may have never thought this hard about it, I, on the other hand, our first option is also the simplest. Brainiac is indeed still dwelling within Lex in some fashion. You melded with the computer being Brainiac. And at your moment of triumph, the Justice League destroyed him. Tragic. Yes, Robo Lexi Poo was defeated when Flash blasted the Brainiac bits right off of Lex like a hard boiled eggshell, but we don't really get a great look at exactly what Flash did. Just a bunch of lights and swirls and then a big explosion. Side note, this is the coolest <laughs> scene in the entire DCAU. Argue with me in the comments, I dare you. Drive up this video's engagement, see what I care. When Flash hits, I can't commit to the bit, Luthoriac at super speed, we get a lot of views of physical damage he's doing on a surface level. But unless he's also like facing through Lex to remove any Brainiac DNA, so to speak, he may have left some of that programming behind. After all, he'd never gone that fast before. He didn't really know what he was doing. I feel kind of funny. It certainly seemed like the episode was trying to tell us, hey kid, Brainiac's kaput, okay? There ain't nothing left. But really, Brainiac may never be destroyed. Not fully, anyway. My entire program resides in even the smallest part of me. And the power couple did absorb and assimilate the entirety of Cadmus's confiscated remains of the Dark Heart alien nanotechnology, which got this memorable explanation from Dr. Cox, I, I mean, the atom. You can't just smash up a machine the size of an infection. Leave a crumb of it in Attacked and it'll start all over again. Brainiac is even shown to have survived all the way into the future of the Legion of Superheroes, a thousand years from now, whenever now is. Well, in this episode anyway, it's a thousand years from 1979, where Brainiac 5 says the first Brainiac figured out how to pass down his code biologically, AKA he knocked up an alien chick, or Lex did, and his Brainiac 5's great, 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 I use fruit. Great, great. Grandpa. But if Brainiac 5 exists, where are Brainiacs 2 through 4? If there's even a sliver of Brainiac's code left in Lex's body when he's lying there huffing and puffing, it could certainly present itself in the form of a visual through Lex's optic nerves or however that mumbo jumbo works. Brain is in his name after all. But it's also possible it could act as a receiver for a sort of Brainiac Wi-Fi. A Brainiac cloud, if you will, must exist after all. It stands to reason that the version of Brainiac that lodged itself inside Luther Thor all the way back during S-Task shouldn't know about the events of the Justice League episode Twilight, which, while heavily Brainiac-centric, took place years later in outer space, extremely disconnected from Lex Luthor or his computer systems in any way. And yet, I have learned from my encounter with Darkseid that organic beings cannot be trusted. Um. Huh? Your encounter with Darkseid? You've been camping out in Lex's spleen for half a decade, my friend. In Twilight, we see that Brainiac has been operating out of a giant asteroid, comic bookly shaped like his own head, for new god knows how long. This base is filled with Brainiac duplicates, physical shells that house his programming, ready to be sent off to all corners of the galaxy to do his bidding, and theoretically controlled hive mind style by the real Brainiac from this central head asteroid. And even though this does blow up at the end of the episode, killing every 
everyone and everything inside, including Darkseid, my point still stands. Loser. Brainiac can indeed project or transmit his consciousness to other extensions of that consciousness, other hosts of the Brainiac programming. He's done it before, and he can do it again. If a piece of Brainiac still remained inside Lex, however small, then wherever Brainiac's actual essence, his root program, currently resides, could absolutely call out to him, and would absolutely retain the memories, or Brainiac equivalent of a search history, including the one that hardcore bonded with Lex Luthor, and the one that fought Rockface, no matter what skin shell he calls home, Brainiac is Brainiac. And even though that core Brainiac Prime, or whatever we want to call it, is now tiny little pieces floating around in space, my entire program resides in even the smallest part of me. Who's to say those little pieces aren't pinging out the Brainiac hotspot 24-7, like Starlink, but run by someone evil? Okay, maybe exactly like Starling. It seems even JLU's writers might have been heading in this direction originally, as it turns out that one of the folks who holds a Secret Society Platinum membership, The Key, who rescues Lex from the police in the season's debut episode and sets the whole plot in motion, was supposed to be revealed to be a brainiac construct of some kind. Yeah. You remember, originally it was gonna be The Key. Yeah. Oh, the, the Key was literally going to be The Key. The Key was going to be a construct of brainiacs that we were gonna somehow bring well, Darkseid back. That's why we used back. him so much at the beginning. The key was voiced by Corey Burton, Brainiac's voice actor. He looks vaguely Brainiac-like, the facial bone structure, the deeply shadowed emo eyes, that cute little pointy nose. He's even got the three dots on his costume, a hidden Mickey. His key gun that unlocks any lock is something of a specialty of mine. Which you could kind of stretch to say could be Brainiac firing a beam of nanites that hack whatever thing they're fired at, much like when Brainiac hacked Lex's spinal cord with his own beam. It's Brainiac! He's the key! So even though this key subplot was apparently dropped and is therefore probably not really canon, since it was a thing at one point, it's still very possible that despite all appearances in the eyes of his criminal comrades, Lex seeing Brainiac is really happening. But... Uh, I don't know. Head Brainiac here acts very interested in reuniting with his former human hybrid hamburger helper. I could reconstitute you, bring you back to life. Yes, we could be together again. It was never Brainiac's intention to 100% fuse with Luthor. The dude was just his plan B vessel in the event that he needed to carry on if Superman destroyed his rebuilt basement body, which he did. Well, he turned him into a big magnet and then that dead magnet got sent to the dump or whatever, but you know what I mean. Brainiac's original plan in JLU was to install himself into a new Amazo with Lex's face body. But since Amanda Waller melted it, you forced my hand. It wasn't until Luthor convinced him that becoming one being would be beneficial to Brainiac's ultimate download everything and then kill everything goals that Brainiac agreed and did so. It was never Brainiac's plan, and it's unlikely he'd want to try it again after such a horrific failure. It is possible that it's just a means to an end, that Brainiac doesn't actually intend to become Luthoriac again, but he just needs Lex to think that. Just listen to the way he speaks to Lex. You're a resourceful human, Luthor. I'm sure you'll find a way. Couple this with that we could be together again line, and you've got a Brainiac who's pushing Lex in the direction of an almost emotional reunion, and even complimenting him. But Brainiac never really talked like this, except for when he was half Lex. We remake the universe. Brainiac doesn't value people, he just values knowledge. It is extremely unlikely that your inferior human intellect has anything to offer me. Since we've become so close, I'm gonna let that pass. He rarely shows emotion, and when it does happen, it's completely selfish. When he first comes to Earth back in Estas, he does worry about the safety of his ball pit. Orbs. He does care about self-preservation. In the event that whatever crumb of Brainiac floating around inside Lex is all that remains of him anywhere ever, then reconjoining with Lex may be his only way to come back from the dead. You'll always come back to me. Yeah. I guess I do, don't I? But another reason the Force Ghost Brainiac's motivations may feel very human is that perhaps what we're seeing, what Lex is seeing, is not Brainiac at all, but in fact, something much closer to human, at least from an evolutionary standpoint. You know, like a big monkey. 
Hey, we do a giveaway every month and here it be. If this is you, you win all this stuff. We left a reply to your comment with some instructions, so go take a look. Next up is this stuff. You can win it by leaving a comment below answering our question of the day from the end of this video. We'll pick a random winner next time. That's all there is to it, baby. Oh, and there's another new shirt. Go get it. You know you want this. Just look at it. It is very wearable. You can put it on your body. Yes, an option just as possible to me is that instead of this actually being Brainiac, Grodd himself is tricking Luthor with his mind control powers. I'll get to the hows and whys in a second, but think about it. Grodd is a manipulative asshole. It's his entire character. He psychologically influences everyone around him for his own dastardly ends. From the romantic in Tala, Giganta, or that doctor he met on Match.com, to the powerful in every supervillain under the sun joining his swamp-based mafia. It would take a huge scam to pay for all these people. Actually, it's the other way around. They pay me. And I'm not talking about when he uses his super friends Aquaman talk to fish sonar waves to literally make someone do something. His big ape brain serves multiple purposes. He's smarter than he looks. He doesn't need to use his psychic superpowers to get what he wants. And what he wants is for everyone to kneel before Grodd. And to that end, I think it's very possible that he's combining his mental abilities to fake the Brainiac vision in Lex's head in order to puppeteer Lex's actions. Unlike Brainiac's arguable lack of motivation, Grodd absolutely has reason to orchestrate a Lex Luthor that's under his hairy heel. He wants Lex to be in his Legion of Secrets. Man, we should really make a pokey rap about all of these guys. Mostly, it seems, so that there isn't necessarily a competition with leadership over the world's supervillains. You're much too powerful a player to be out there freelance. As the two of them led the most memorable and impactful versions of such groups that we saw in the DCAU. And I'm not counting the Superman Revenge Squad or whatever from the start of Hereafter. If you need Corey Burton to voice half your membership, you're not a real bad guy gang. Eventually, when Grodd tries to turn the people of the world into apes, Luthor does do a coup and takes over the Society of Doom Legion, but hey, big smart gorilla can't think that many steps ahead. Either way, if you think back to the opening episode of this season, when we first see Lex talking to Imaginariac, he's driving a prisoner transport van that he hijacked moments before Bugs Bunny came out from behind the Warner Brothers logo, and as we see when the key hoverbikes him to Swamp Town, this is likely miles away from from Grodd's location. And in theory, Grodd would have had to have been projecting this fake Brainiac vision into Lex's head for a while before his breakout, while Lex was in prison, in order for Lex to get the initial encouragement to break out in the first place. Grodd's powers would need to reach pretty far, but it's possible Grodd was closer to Lex than we know. After all, in Justice League Season 2, we saw his little floaty Star Wars droid cameras watching and studying the League from a great distance. Grodd's a sneaky little bitch. Once Luthor has been brought to the big Darth Vader head stronghold, Grodd reveals he is in possession of a chunk of Brainiac, which he uses as leverage to get Luthor to join his group. How he got that Brainiac piece? I have no idea. Brainiac's head stroid blew up within Javelin 7 flight distance of Apocalypse and New Genesis, incalculably far away from Earth, and the big monkey can't go to space? Big monkeys don't survive in space! The only other Brainiac piece similar to this we see post-Twilight on the DCAU timeline is this bit the Justice League has on the Watchtower in their static shock cross. Crossover. Even though this aired before Twilight, but let's not get into that right now. Just go watch our Static Shock timeline video later. It's hard to believe that's the last piece of Brainiac circuitry. The last that we know of. And while these two little scraps certainly look different, exhibit Joker's face, and we never see what happens to the chunk the League has. But whether or not it's the same piece, or a piece Grodd somehow retrieved from Apocalyptian airspace without being gunned down by Darkseid's big chest nerf gun, the fact is, he has it. And what better way to hammer the point home than to fabricate a psychic image of Brainiac going, hey man, come on, help me out here, to go along with it. Now, while we could say that this Brainiac chunk is connected to that Brainiac cloud, I brought up, and it itself is what's transmitting the visions into Lex's head, unbeknownst to Grodd or anyone else, when Lex does get a hold of this chunk after his monkey mutiny, nothing he does scientifically can unlock it. And you'd think, as someone who was, like, just half Brainiac a few months ago and is currently supposedly conversing with the real Brainiac all the time, he could figure it out fairly easily but he never does. It takes Tala using Full Metal Alchemist powers to link the piece, narratively and physically, to the events of Twilight. Transmutation is what you want to do! Transmutation is... 
What are you waiting for? Do it! So it's likely that Grodd's mysteriously acquired Brainiac chunk was dead on arrival, just like the hard drives I ordered off Amazon a couple weeks ago. Do not order hard drives off Amazon! This misdirect, with the piece never even being viable to begin with, even goes hand in hand with Grodd's presumed Brainiac projection, a foolproof plan to seduce Lex. I'm coming! Into joining him under the false hope of re brainiacing with a Brainiac who doesn't even exist. Now, something you eagle eyed viewers may think to point out is that Grodd does seem to act confused when he witnesses Lex talking to nobody right next to him. You got that right. Completely missing the point. Luthor? But this could easily be to throw Lex and the audience off the scent. Right after this confusion, Grodd rattles off that recap of what happened at the end of the previous season, so he's definitely aware of the situation and could therefore exploit it. The big pro Grodd clue for me comes in the form of this line of dialogue from the final episode of the show. Dark side took Brainiac away from me. I can't hear his voice in my head anymore. The events of the JLU series finale are essentially a two-parter. Alive, based on the name of a KISS album, which is almost entirely villain-focused, and Destroyer, based on the name of a KISS album, which teams up the DCAU's notable good guys and bad guys against an invasion by Darkseid. But wait! Didn't you say Darkseid died in Twilight? Yes, well, you see, Lex uses a combo of his own tech and violently forced magic from the Witch Tala to attempt to bring Brainiac back from all that asteroid rubble but instead accidentally brings back your new lord and master. Wait. Your new lord and master. Hey, that's kind of fun. Darkseid is back and badder than ever, now seemingly combined with Brainiac himself. Or is he? The episode's writer, Matt Wayne, says he's not an amalgam of himself and Brainiac, that's his KISS costume! While producer and season story plotter Dwayne McDuffie says yes, Tala gave Brainiac's powers to Darkseid as a final act of revenge against Luthor. So, um, it's both? For the record, I think Matt's either mistaken, misremembering, or just messing with y'all. I thought it was pretty well implied that at least some of Brainiac's matter got fused with Darkseid's when he was reconfigured and resurrected. That's how I interpreted it anyway. Suggesting a vaguely defined diffusion with Brainiac, along with a slight power upgrade. I'm more powerful than I've ever been. I suppose I could agree in that he can, I guess, fly now? They fly now! He can do this weird warbly hand force field thing, and he can evaporate glass? And of course, it requires Superman to give a speech about cardboard in order to get his ass almost handed to him. But what about that supposed plan to have the key be a part of Brainiac, instrumental in the return of Darkseid? I Am Legion was written before the season was greenlit. The idea of the LOD arc predates it's my involvement in Luthor talking to an unseen Brainiac, now truly both mad and scientist, does too. I've heard from both Bruce and Dwayne that a lot of this came from the mind of Dwayne, but I wasn't in the room. By then we realized we only had seven shows left and pretty much knew what the remaining episodes were. Initially, we thought the key would play a bigger part than he did, but that didn't really pan out story-wise, so we went in another direction. Now why is it you always find the keys in the last place you look? So by the time the writers knew where they were going with the series finale, and not doing a big Brainiac revival reveal after all, they lost the keys behind the couch and hoped nobody noticed. It was, after all, only extremely mildly hinted at, even for folks like me. The key even cited against Luthor in the big final bad guy fight, so take that as you will. So if all that was left of Brainiac in the whole universe was in those floaty space bits, and if Darkseid did truly fuse with said bits after they, and his own bits, got all vacuumed up, then I guess I can concede that Darkseid's supposed Brainiac fusion could be the cause for the disappearance of the Brainiac that Lex is seeing. You destroyed Brainiac, and I'm going to make you pay! But think about what also happens right around this same time. Get in. Airlock. That's right, Lex says he can't hear Brainiac's voice in his head anymore only after he flushes Grodd out into space. Sure, a few minutes pass between Grodd's demise and Darkseid's undemise, but Lex is super distracted bringing back who he expects to be Brainiac. He's very excited. Brainiac, I'm- Did he even notice exactly what the catalyst was for the Brainiac vision's extinguishing? It makes all the sense in the fourth world that the minute Grodd's simian structure flatlined, his fake Brainiac 
Brainiac brainwaves would follow suit, and the timing couldn't have been more perfect. I don't believe in coincidence. And what in the world does Lex's airlock code stand for? June 6th, 1969? It's not his first comic book appearance, nor Grodd's, nor anyone else substantial I can find. Some crew member's birthday? Did Lex just think it would be cool to make it the funny sex number? Sometimes a number is just a number. Shut up, Dan! You're not my real dad! When Luthor and The Flash switch bodies in The Great Brain Robbery, neither of them sees and interacts with Brainiac. Not Flash in Luthor's body, not Luthor in Flash's body. I bet we all would have found it confusing to stage a needless complication for a comedic mind swap episode. Much easier for us to luck into nobody seeing Brainiac. But if we want a canonical explanation, Grodd was caught in the middle of the brain switch and knew it had happened, so he wouldn't have kept sending the signal, so to speak. There would have been no point, and it could have given away his whole scheme. A scheme which, at this point in the season, would have amounted to just a bit of good old fucking around, but still. Unfortunately, all of that being said in Grodd's favor, continuity speaking, Grodd doesn't actually die. In issue number 39 of the JLU tie-in comic, Batman and Elongated Man accompany Detective Chimp, yes, that's a real thing, to Gorilla City, also a real thing, where they learn that Grodd eventually returned from space, but was imprisoned by Chief of Security David Ogden Stiers. Flowers, chocolates promises you don't intend to keep. Grodd also returned in the much more canon Justice League Infinity series, mentioned in that comic's run off into the sunset. And the adventure continues. Closing moments. So the dude survived being sucked out into space? But how? Correction, sir. That's blown out. Thank you, Data. Well, any number of ways. Picked up by a passing ship like Superman and Jean were in War World, saved by a Green Lantern or the like. We found ourselves dependent on the kindness of strangers. Maybe I'm wrong and big monkeys can survive in space. No, they can't, you say? Well, they also can't talk, Linda. Flash survived in space for a bit in Maid of Honor, or all those leaguers that Amazo took out in The Return. The General got pushed out of the Watchtower in 90s JLA comics, and he's just chilling on an asteroid the next time we see him. Perhaps Grodd has connections with other planets. How else did he have a chunk of Brainiac from the Twilight Explosion? Or maybe he hitched a ride on the Viking Prince's boat. There's endless explanations with a little imagination, and there's always Bruce Timm's supervillain death claws. You really can't count any character as dead unless you see the body, even more so unless you see it cremated or otherwise irreparably destroyed even by comic book logic. And yet, even that much didn't stop the Joker from cheating death. Anything is possible in the land of make believe Leave. But he's he's in hyperspace, so if we have to bring him back, that's right. Oh yeah, we could absolutely bring him back if we had to, but because they're in I warp, don't see how he, he could be in in on the warp place. So if Grodd didn't die, why did the Brainiac vision stop? He may have gone unconscious, which still could have caused the vision shutdown, or maybe he just didn't need to toy with Lex anymore because the villain-on-villain -villain space insurrection was already happening, and Grodd had moved on. But is that every possible option exhausted? God damn it, that's not all. You can just kiss all that goodbye. Realistically, we do have an option three. Lex is just losing it. Grodd must have used mind control. Okay. Maybe not. Now, I'm not saying Lex wasn't seeing the Brainiac visions. He was. I'm just saying it was his mind's own doing. He was feeling sensations that he thought were dead. No squealing. And remember that it's all in his head. Psycho. Luthor being mentally unstable does track. He seems to slip further and further from having a grip over the course of JL and JLU. I mean, just think of everything he's gone through. So much for your images, the benevolent businessman. This is the end of an era. He loses LexCorp, which he spent his entire life building, gets cancer, fails to destroy Superman in the Justice League time and again, even when he tries using a skyscraper-sized Evangelion, gets a full pardon on his sentence by shooting Justice League doppelgangers with a big laser gun, runs a years-long fake presidential campaign, all just to tick Superman off, fails to get rid of the League on Cadmus's terms, suddenly becomes cancer-free, has giant robot tentacles burst out of his body, becomes one with a Kryptonian supercomputer, gets violently separated from it, and then gets carted off off to jail for presumably the rest of his life. Guess it makes sense that he would at least start seeing stuff. And they're going to burn for it. Burn! Okay, different Lex, but you get it. You'd think if the visions were, well, real, aka actually Brainiac, or Grodd pretending to be Brainiac, that it would be a bigger plot point throughout the season. Like, things would culminate in another big Brainiac fight. Even poor Goldface knew that Luthor and Brainiac had been an item. So you merge with a living computer like you did before. It was probably 
probably newsworthy of Snapper Carr, Angela Chen, Summer Gleason, Sroya Bashir, and Jack Ryder, the Creeper, combined. Of course, the point is that we do think it's going to lead up to that, and everything is subverted by Darkseid showing up instead. And that was probably the best choice, as it would have just been a repeat of the prior season's big climax. I'm come. But still, we'd probably have seen Brainiac more often, and or for longer periods of time. At a certain point in the season, he just stops appearing. We get a glimpse at the start of I Am Legion, the end of I Am Legion, and the start of Grudge Match. That's it. Maybe Lex saw him more than we saw him see him, but who knows? We deliberately left it open to interpretation, but personally, I think Brainiac's ghost was totally a figment of Lex's imagination. In other words, Lex was cracked and manifested the ghost himself just out of his own burning desire. When Starkseid returned, Lex's subconscious was convinced that Brainiac was gone for good. Hence, Brainy's voice went bye-bye. We never even considered that Garad was manipulating Lex by sending him visions of his lost partner in Godhood. Hmm, interesting interpretation. I can see that it's possible. Not much definitive textual evidence to support it, though. Not much textual evidence, sir? You know something, Bruce? You're not always right. It's possible it was Grodd? That's a win in my book, and my book is full of losses. So maybe it's Grodd, maybe it isn't. Normally I'd take anything Bruce says as law. It's canon. But it doesn't seem like it was the intention anyway. Though, what is a good fan theory if not an inventive reinterpretation of the data we're provided? I thought Brainiac was real, but I also knew that our stories were arranged to not commit to it either way. Dwayne rightly knew that sort of ambiguity drives the fans crazy and makes the drama better. It sure does, Matt. It sure does. In the end, if it were up to me, I'd say at the very least, Lex does still have some Brainiac left in him. Coming. Lex was able to pass through the friggin' source wall after Metron told him that only a 12th level intellect has the slightest hope of surviving what you are about to experience. Would you say I'm a level 7 susceptible? No, because why would I? Because that's Moon Man talk. Crap, now I have to wonder if Metron was ever even really there. Look, I know we did a whole video about Metron maybe being a Lex Luthor from an alternate universe, but now I almost want the other character that only Lex ever sees to just be another resident of Luthor's home for imaginary friends. But hey, this is all just a theory. A DCAU theory. Thank you very much again to Babbel for sponsoring this video and to all of our wonderful Patreon supporters. Once we get to 200 of you, we'll do a Will It Canon episode on if Teen Titans and the Batman exist in the same universe, and I know you want to see that, so hey man, come on, help me out here! People say all the time they want Brainiac to be the big bad in a live-action Superman movie, so for my question of the day, I want to know what aspects of his history would you want adapted? I must call James Gunn immediately! And, of course, also let me know which theory regarding Brain Brainiac you subscribe to. You will regret your decision. We all will. You said he'd come!